nonprofit community radio station that is made possible by generous donations from individuals and the following sponsors. Tea cookies, thumbprint cookies, chocolate burgers. All of this and more is available at the Village Bake Shop, open from 6 to 6, Monday through Friday, and 6 to 5 on Saturday. The Village Bake Shop is located at the Village Green Town Center and has been satisfying Cleveland's sweet tooth since 1961. Give them a call at 476-5179 or come and see them at the Village Green Town Center. Brownies, cupcakes, wedding and birthday cakes, muffins. Check into checking the cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Short on cash? Check into cash gives you more money for your title and the lowest title loan rate anywhere. If you already have a title loan, ask Check into Cash about paying it off. No credit check, no run around. Check into cash won't slow you down. Check into cash loans you the most for your title. Get the lowest rate on a title loan and the most money only at Check into Cash. Check into Check into Cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Oh, yeah. Check into Cash is your money machine. Get on up and get down. Check into Cash. Bring proof of lower rate on similar title loan restrictions apply. Visit checkintocash.com for the store nearest you. Hi, this is Glenn from U.S. Money Shops. If you need up to $2,500 in quick cash and have a clear title on your vehicle, visit your nearest U.S. Money Shops and get a title loan. Ask about our low rate, and chances are you'll be shocked at how competitive we are. So come on down to U.S. Money Shops, located in Chattanooga on Brainerd Road, or in Cleveland across from Kyle Dodge. Buy yourself a pawn today. Put that in a way at U.S. Money Shops. U.S. Money Shops. Buy, sell, pawn. We do it all. Train endurance engineers spend their lives pushing our heating and cooling units to the brink. But they're like anyone else. They go to sporting events. Daddy just pulverizing fancy boy. They go on vacations. Salt water. Take a little hard. And they go to work, putting train units through every test imaginable. Water cannon ready, sir. Any words for Big Daddy? It might stink. They're the reason a train is so reliable. A little. But where did they come up with the ideas? This is the perfect time to get your heating equipment serviced. Maximum capacity and efficiency can be maintained if your system is in good operating order. Call Mechanical Systems today to get $20 off of your heating equipment inspection and service. We also design and sell new high efficiency systems and change outs are our specialty. Mechanical Systems has been providing high quality service and installations for over 30 years. 336-5739. That same number is good for 24-7 emergency repairs. That's 423-336-5739. It's hard to stop a train really hard at buy here pay here usa under the blimp we would like to invite you to a better car buying experience we have a six month six thousand mile powertrain warranty and ask about our auto pay program where you can earn free oil changes every 90 days for the life of your loan we have small down payments and we'll even finance your sales tax and tag carfax is available and in most cases we'll have you driving away in your new car in less than an hour visit one of our two convenient locations in cleveland or dayton today or visit us online at buyherepayhereusa.com or call us at 877-794-A-CAR dr christopher chase with associates in plastic and reconstructive surgery now in cleveland on wednesdays at 2350 okoy street Call 624-0021 for an appointment now. Certified by the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Offering facial procedures, body contouring, skin resurfacing, and specializing in breast augmentation, including the newest transumbilical or belly button augmentation for less scarring, ladies. Call Dr. Christopher Chase for an appointment now, 624-0021. You're listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson on Woof FM. Call. 423-614-5553 to join in on the conversation. Now, back to Backfire. All right, we're back here in the midst of the gunfight. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about uh, the, the guns this morning. John Thanberry has brought a uh, guest with him, Warren Duncan, uh, with volu Volunteer Ordinance Works. And then uh, Franklin Chancy has brought uh, Andy Brown with him this morning. So we're having conversations about the gun laws. Let's take a call. Go ahead, caller. You're live. Uh, yes. Um, 
this is Donna. I think we're kind of missing the point here. What we need to look at is the ownership of the gun. If you own the gun, like, for instance, we had the trooper that left his gun laying around and his granddaughter got a hold of it. Mm-hmm. You should be responsible for your gun. Like the woman that her son got it went there, you know, he, he killed her first. Right. If he had had that gun locked up, he could not have got that gun. Just like if you know you give a drunk driver the keys to your car, you're liable. Mm-hmm. So if you let someone have access to your gun that's registered to you, then you're liable. And that would stop a lot of people. But they're going to have to be responsible. Well, I understand what you're saying, and the, the liability is with the owner of the gun. That's for that's for certain. You know, I'm not sure that uh, this uh, this kid uh, didn't get that uh, gun out of a lock and key situation, possibly, and then shoot his mother, and then go do what he did. He was actually on a mission. Well, Steve, one thing I think we could agree on: n- nobody would really uh, disagree with that statement. The problem is, how do you affect that? Because what do you want the government to come in and? and uh, inspect every home? You know, do you want a list uh, uh, with government agents coming in to see whether your guns are locked up? That's our problem. It's it's liberty that we have to try to balance this against. You know, um, if, a gun, if, if a gun is registered to you, you are responsible for it, like you're responsible for your vehicle. If you loan it to somebody that's, not, that's drunk, you're responsible. So you're saying, I mean, right now all guns are not registered. So you're no. saying you want them all registered? No, I'm saying that if somebody takes a gun, your gun, if it is registered, you're liable. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. If it's not registered, then it's lost in the system. But if you come up and say, "Hey, that was my gun," you know. Well, let me let me let me change. Let me ask you a question. Do you think your gun should be registered? Uh, I am. Um, I have a permit to carry. I have some registered and some not registered. Okay. And I'm a Democrat, so what about that? Yeah. Well, do you think lots of Democrats? Do you think that. all your guns should be registered? Well, if I I I've had the choice of buying some through the stores, through the gun shows, and I've also bought from individuals. That's that's so a I, good that's a good question to ask Warren about what his position is on that. I mean, I've I've always heard it said, you know. If you're a law-abiding individual, you have nothing to hide. what is your reason for objecting to that that concept? What do you, what's your opinion you're about, about registering a gun? Yeah. Okay. When somebody purchases a gun from us at our shop, the background checks making sure that the gun's okay, meaning it's not stolen, it's not in the system, making sure that person t- is able well, to buy it. But we do not register a gun. It, no I mean, let's just say, do yeah. you think all guns should be registered? You're having to register when you sell, right? No, 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 no sir. But there's no record kept of that. Yeah. Okay. Once, once that background check is completed, mm-hmm. the government is required by law to delete that because we don't want a government list of who owns guns and who don't. Like they reported in New York. How how did they get the report in New York? That That was was carry permits. Gun carry permit. And so then all the prison guards got threats because the inmates said, we know where you live, we know what we can do. There's now been a a burglary specifically related to that list. They targeted this gentleman because they knew he had guns. They didn't get any. They couldn't open his safe. But to answer Mr. Franklin's question. Uh, uh, Wait a minute. Is our caller still on the line? Yes. Yes. Anything else? That's all. Uh, thank you for calling. So you're telling. So I think your argument just there, John, was that because people knew that somebody had guns, that they specifically targeted him. Now, isn't that completely contrary to the position that you took just previously, saying that if you've got guns, you're less likely to be affected by a criminal? No. What I, what I said was the whole benefit to society of, of guns, and that's one of the arguments with concealed carry versus open carry. You, if you don't own a gun, benefit because the criminal doesn't know who owns a gun and who doesn't own a gun. That's the benefit to society. Let's well, take I a said, call. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, if you're uh, being charged with a felony and, and the charges are dismissed and expunged, do you still... Can you still get a gun permit, or? Well, it's very hard to get an expungement of a felony. Uh, there are very limited circumstances where that can happen. Typically, what you're talking about then is actually a pardon from the governor. Uh, but otherwise, no. Okay. I mean, if the charge is just dismissed, then it's not a conviction on your record, so it wouldn't affect your ability to own uh, a firearm or to get a permit. So if you 
been charged and wasn't convicted, charges were dismissed. That's right. You can still uh, get a gun permit. If it shows a dismissal on your record, that can't be held against you. Okay, sir. Well, thank you very much. Now, while the charges are pending. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It certainly could, because that I think that does appear on the background check when you do that, that there are pending charges at that point. Uh, Biden wants us to look into smart guns. Yeah. They already exist. Uh, basically, the smart gun is, uh, is a very expensive gun. Uh, it basically uh, uh, it uh, it won't biometrics is it typically how it's used. In other words, it has to to um, uh, uh, somehow be regulated by my the uh, my hand. Your fingerprints. That's your right. fingerprints. fingerprints. Okay. Go ahead, caller. You're live. Hey guys. Um, yeah, that's smart gun. That sounds like a good idea. So that if something happens, it's your gun. Your wife can't pick it up to use it. To, uh, defend you or your friend can't pick it up to use it to defend you that that sounds like a real winner now um, now keep in mind I, I understand your concern there but it's just we have programmable uh, desktop safes down at our shop that we sell to the consumer that are all biometric because you cannot use a key to open up you can't run a combination when the threat level is the highest and our and at that point we're freaking out we sell safes. So all you do is you stick your finger in a hole, the laser reads your fingerprint, and the door flips open with your gun. We can program multiple fingerprints to sure. open that safe. So on a smart gun, it could also be programmed sure. for more than one person. I, I, think the, I, think the, I think the argument is that it's a situation there where it's not likely that your five-year-old kid is going to pick himself up well, and accidentally shoot himself. Well, now, well, now, to really throw a monkey wrench into this. Wait a minute. Let her call her let's, speak to me. Let's, 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 let's be clear. You know, I work with you know, race cars and complicated, uh, all types of complicated electronics. I found that in most cases, when you need something to work, that uh, KISS is the extremely uh, uh, the best approach, which is keep it simple, stupid. Um, you know, because as you make add complexity to a system, you also deteriorate its ability to function. So I don't find that an acceptable uh, situation at all. Here's what, let, let's, let's look at this thing from a constitutional perspective. Uh, they're, they're, the Constitution and the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution and put the Second Amendment in there. <clears throat> this was not for hunting rights. This was not for your, you know, so that you could go out and target practice. This was to prevent tyranny. And tyranny can be perpetrated by anyone who has power government, whatever. And so as you talk about all of these things that you're talking about, and I hear it, it, what alarms me probably more than anything is the amount of status mentality that I hear here that somehow the most inefficient entity in the world, which is government, can somehow resolve these issues. And in reality, these issues are caused by government. When you look at these crime statistics in the United States, why don't we take out all the gun incidents that happen in cities that have and municipalities that have very strict gun laws? Let's take those out of the picture. Let's look at where, uh, where, the, where Obama comes from. Let's take Chicago that had almost 400 gun murders last year with some of the strictest gun laws in the country. Let's look at this alleged shooting, whatever really happened in Sandy Hook. Let's look at that. Now you have a state that has one of the strictest gun laws in the, in the, in the United States. They have all types of gun laws. How did that affect that? It affected it none whatsoever. I heard, uh, Franklin, you're talking about something uh, sounding like an implication to me that somehow you wanted to, you know, codify or unify all the gun laws throughout the country actually is in direct violation of the separation of, hey, of the... Uh, of, uh, Dan, we need to finish up here. I've got four guests in the studio. We need to finish okay. talking. What's your question? Right. Well, my question is, how can any... How, this is, you're wanting to solve this problem with a government. Question. You can't even deliver the mail. All right. Thanks, Dan. Right. Well, let me throw out something that'll be a real difficult topic. Um, 
when you talk about these smart guns, you greatly in, in, and I'm not against them. You know, it's it's a good idea, I guess. And if if I was a an owner and, and I was concerned about my children picking it up, maybe it's something I want. But it greatly increases the cost of a gun. So then we fall back to what what does that do to the rights of self protection for poor people? And the history of gun control in America is explicitly a racist history. Most all of the original gun control laws were put in place to keep blacks and Mexicans from owning guns. And if you want to go down, I can show you where the Tennessee Constitution was actually changed to only protect the gun rights of white people. Now, we've gone back and changed that back. One of the first federal attempts at gun control and gun confiscation was at Wounded Knee. And after the majority of the Indians had turned in their guns at Wounded Knee, they were promptly killed. 297 people were killed, 200 of which were women and children. So there are some racist implications here. There are, are class implications here. If you put a smart gun law in place, what does that tell the inner city poor mother? How does she protect her child when she can't afford a $2,000 gun? All right, let me, uh, let me share a few things with you guys, all of you. You know, I've been asking questions all week about these guns and gun control and what people think about them and so forth. <clears throat> and I hear from some hardcore Republicans, and I've been hearing from some hardcore Democrats, but I'm not sure that everyone was totally opposed to some kind of um, restrictions on guns um, that uh, um, I guess are similar to the, the guns that we, the gun that was used in this killing. Uh, now that I don't know what you do, I think there's probably something small that we can do to uh, 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 make people feel a little more at ease um, with this. I'm not sure that we can do anything without getting a lot of bureaucracy going. I think um, Mr. Obama is now heading, uh, he's trying to be a cheerleader and trying to move on. He's going to surround himself with the children today and have a speech about this. And uh, I think that was the wrong thing to do. Uh, uh, do you, do you uh, Steve? Let me, let me. I mean, right now, I know what you're saying, John. You're saying nothing needs to change. No, I didn't say that at all. Uh, what what, need, what, what I, could change then? In here, here's a good example. Uh, about ten years ago, during the first assault weapons ban, the NRA pushed a program called Project Exile in Richmond, Virginia. Right. That what they did was any commission of a crime with a gun was prosecuted at the federal level. The gun crimes in, in Richmond, Virginia, dropped out of the bottom. because, as a matter of fact, you actually had gang members. Now, this is one of the other arguments. They switched to baseball bats and knives, right. but they actually were on record as saying, we don't commit a crime with a gun now because you're doing hard well, that's time. A, that's a pretty good thing, then. The NRA pushed that, and what they said was, you have a gun law on the books. Let's enforce it vigorously. Okay. Go ahead, caller. You're live. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Let me ask you a question. Is cocaine illegal in the United States of America? Is cocaine illegal in the United States of America? Right now it is. Okay. Does that stop people from doing cocaine? Does that stop people from doing cocaine, guys? Yes, stop it stops somebody, I bet. <laughs> it stops the majority of people do it from doing it, I'd say. I, I don't believe that that stops a criminal that's determined to do cocaine. Well, there, there, there are some laws that there clearly have had an impact. There's a substantially higher punishment if you break into somebody's home and you have a firearm with you when you do it. In fact, most home burglaries these days do not involve somebody bringing a firearm with them because that eventually filtered out onto the street that it didn't make good sense from a personal jeopardy standpoint. I'm going to go to jail a lot longer. That's something that we do tend to enforce. Uh, so if you break into a, a, a convenience store or a bank and you've got a firearm, the penalties are dramatically higher. So from that standpoint, that's a gun law. It that's does, gun, in fact, have an impact. That's a gun law that the NRA pushed and supported. And, okay. and, and a matter of fact, but, you know, nobody, nobody, has, See, nobody has said that the NRA has never done anything that was helpful or that every idea they've pushed is bad. My complaint is... Everything anybody else suggests, the NRA is automatically opposed to no, without really not. having a they're conversation to about it. When it involves government getting a list of gun owners, because the history of the world is not good with that. The largest number of people executed with guns have been executed at the hands of governments. 
Caller, are you Amen. still there? Go ahead. Amen. All right. right Thank you. You know, you see the billboards out there. Hard Gun crime means hard crime. And, I, you know, when it comes to we as a society, in my opinion, we don't have the stomach to enforce the law or put the consequences of breaking the law at such a level people will not do it. You know, when you think about using a vehicle to run somebody over when you're drunk and what the consequences, you know, I've said all along, if you, if you want to talk about numbers and saving lives and your first defense DUI gets you, you're in prison, you'd cut down on probably a large majority of DUI. But we don't have the stomach to enforce that. Yeah. Uh, so the crime, if we do have hard times for gun crimes, like we say, you know, that's fine and dandy until the end result of a mass shooting is that person taking his own life because he doesn't care about the hard crime because he's never going to do that. So you make that penalty as, as strong as you want, but if it, suicide's the end result, there, you know, there's nothing that he has to answer to. And nearly all of those people, including the Sandy Hook incident, the guy shot himself as soon as he was confronted by the police. And that's an argument for guns being in the schools in the hand of an administrator or somebody. And matter of fact, the polling is showing teachers are flocking to these gun training uh, courses, very similar to the one that uh, our own state Representative Eric Watson has proposed on the state level. All right, let's it. take a call here. Go ahead, caller. Hey, uh, there's a uh, misconception. He didn't take an AR-15 into that school. I agree. He took pistols into that school, and they've changed the story from two pistols to four pistols now. And, you know, they just want to demonize certain weapons for some reason. And weapons are weapons. And they should be legal. I mean, it's the people that's the problem. It's not the weapons. You're right. There was a there was an 18 hour line in the sand where they changed their story from him having two guns that and the AR-15 was in the car. After 18 hours, that story changed. Well, call it conspiracy or call it maybe getting well, to the facts. Here's the point. Here's the point. Okay, if we're talking about Sandy Hook, I don't care what kind of weapon was used. If he would have gone on there and beat everybody with the ball bat, I don't care. Uh, the solution, I don't understand the thought process that an administrator or a teacher is the person who's supposed to have the weapon. Why don't we just put more SROs in schools? Why don't we take a proactive approach with more security, like everybody thinks is appropriate, with people who are trained to handle the situation? Now, I, I, I think that the schools, the teachers, the administrators do a phenomenal job here in Bradley County. But here's the concern. These people are going to school. They are working because they want to educate. The, the thought that they have to be the, the line of defense for our students is just quite frankly unfair. You know, I've talked to several teachers, and uh, uh, several of them told me they don't really care. They just soon have a gun. It's not. Yeah, some so teachers don't. Who, some who are very uncomfortable with some, the idea. Some teachers don't. But They're going to be uncomfortable. these proposals but, are voluntary. But there, it's voluntary, and I think you'll find a, enough of uh, the teachers in a school system it. that would have a weapon that would um, – um, would be kept aside, and if ever needed, it would be uh, made available. Caller, you still there? Yeah, we're still here. We're still here. All right. Anything else? I think, I think teachers, you know, if they want to arm themselves to protect themselves, don't really think they should be a, uh, you know, a, a combat force. They're, you know, they're teachers there to, to teach people. But, you know, I understand, too, that they don't want to be sitting ducks for some crazy person. Well, you know, if you're sitting in a school and someone does not know who has a gun and who has a gun, that it's not an outlawed system to have a gun there uh, for— uh, It changes the playing field to the back. It changes the playing field back to where do I yeah. want to go next. If, I, if I'm planning on doing a mass murder, you know, like these guys have gone to theaters— uh, they've gone to schools. Every mass murder shooting in America has happened at a, quote, gun-free zone. Right. Yeah, because they know they're not going to encounter any resistance. Just get rid of the gun-free zones and you won't have a problem then. Yeah, I mean, that that makes logical Andy, I'm okay with what you suggested about more SROs. But All right, the bottom Collar, line thanks. Is, is the budget to take that take care of that? Hey, know? buddy, we got to yeah. take care of our own here. I think the money's got to go out the window. If you want more security, 
Let's you put some security some, but, in the but, school. But, and here's the point. I, yeah. I don't disagree either. And yeah. that's the conversation. And that's the NRA's position. That's the conversation we should be having right now. Why are we diverging off on a argument over a constitutionally protected right when there are things like that that could actually make a difference tomorrow? Yeah. Then why yeah. are we also putting the hands or potentially putting the hands in the guns of our educators in school? When we're giving they're them, not the ones we're giving them their option, and if it. you're going to go down that road, why do we have fire extinguishers hanging on the wall? What's that got to do with anything? Uh, they're not trained firemen, are they? No. Last they, time I checked, what are you, fire extinguishers yes, and guns fire, with teachers. <laughs> fire extinguishers are dangerous. They're uh, chemical. They're caustic. They'll poison. Right. Well, what that, about the IED? Well, that maybe we should people? put maybe we should put uh, some paramedics and uh, some firemen in the schools too. I think you, I'd support that. I'd pay for it too. You're, you know what? Would if, you? If, if schools burning down, would you, John? Were, would were you a pay real problem? Then we would talk about that. That's the point. I've got a good story to tell you guys. Yesterday, I had a friend that got a text from his wife that said that she had gone outside, there was two coyotes uh, close to the house, and she had got his gun and gone out and and had taken two shots at the coyotes. And that, uh, don't worry, everything was okay, uh, nobody's dead, include, including the coyotes. Now then, the moral of the story is, she had never shot a gun. <laughs> she, she'd been listening to all this stuff. And she decided the coyotes had gotten in uh, one of their dogs and uh, and, and uh, torn it up pretty bad. And she took it on her own to go in and get the gun and go out and shoot the coyote. So, uh, you know, that what John referred to, that lady that protected her children down in Georgia, her first phone call was to her husband. Yeah. Her first phone call should have been to 911. Right. But when he, when he answered the phone, he co-dialed 911 on his smartphone and had a three-way call going and he was giving her instructions on what to do remember our training remember what we've done it did everything they said but you know we can't limit uh protecting ourselves by a number and but going back to this let's go into training just a minute because i've had several friends that's gone to get their carry permits recently yes and they said it was kind of an eye-opening experience when they went to get their carry permits in what they were taught. It is. We offer the carry permit at our shop, and uh, we take it. The state mandates what is, what the criteria of the class are, what all the documents are that we put out, and then anything that we put in extra has to be approved by the state. So a lot of people in the past have done a lot of good research, and when we do our class, the state's position on it is it's cover your butt for the state and then from that point we take over and really try to help the persons train up if the if the teachers in the school that want to volunteer that science teacher that veteran that's the pe coach if these people want to step up and go through the specialized training needed for them to be undercover so to speak you know we're not asking them to do it if they don't want to we don't expect that retirement age lady to to do that but if you have a force inside that school, even if it's one administrator, two teachers, you have just quadrupled or tripled the odds of something bad not happening in my opinion. Well, plus the training that Representative Watson's bill provides is the same training that the SRO officers get. So it's voluntary, and if they want to get it, they're going to get crisis training, they're going to get hostage negotiation training. So it's not just, hey, go get a gun and, and look bring at, it in. Look at the Bradley big difference County. is that the, the SRO is a full-time trained professional okay, think about this andy is bradley county sheriff's department trained special deputies to go into our churches from a voluntary standpoint we've got the safest churches in the state because of it you are not going to see a problem at a church in bradley county because it's the most armed buildings we have on a sunday and a wednesday night but Andy, Andy, one other problem here. I don't know here. of any anybody armed at my church, and it's a well, that's, that's exactly the, the point. point. You don't know who's armed. That I know mean everybody at my not. church. I'm pretty sure they're not. Yeah, they're there to protect you. You don't realize it. <laughs> but here, here's here's the other point, Andy. The problem with that argument, and I said this to Franklin last week. What's your alternative? If you're saying, oh, well, we really don't want the teachers to do this, we're not making them do it. But the alternative is cower in your closet and hope you're not no, a victim. No, no. We, we have SROs in. The, the, our schools here. Not every there was an school. SRO officer at the Sandy Hook. He wasn't able to get over there. Put more in. Put more in. Well, what's wrong Who's with that? What if yeah. a teacher? Well, that's willing the point, really, because 
your party has harped and harped and harped about how we can't afford we anything. We don't worry about paying for it. Let's just put them in there. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I have a different perspective because I deal with a broad range of people who come through my office in stressful situations. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of those people could not manage that responsibility, even though under your proposal, legally, there would be nothing Wait to stop them from having I just heard you so say you're that. okay making that decision for them. No, I just, I'm right? not I, making that decision <laughs> for them. But the idea that you're just going to put these people in schools and they've got to go take a course and then it's okay for them to run around with guns Franklin, around our what children we said, what we said just was absurd. we didn't Wait a minute. say we're going to put them What in is there? the difference in that in that in that coach that's carrying a gun and that SRO carrying a gun with the same training. What's the well, difference? We're not going to have the same training. No, wait a minute. Why, what do you mean? They had been a retired policeman? We don't have retired policemen. I mean, basically, you go to guns, you SROs, right? SROs are full-time policemen. Are full-time police well, let, me ask you a que- uh, let me ask you a question. You're right, Franklin. They are full-time. So let's say that a guy goes over here through the academy. He gets out, and they say, you know what? We're going to make you the SRO officer yeah. at this school. What's the difference in that guy and his experience and the coach who says, I'm going to go take the course, and I'm going to be the uh, uh, carrying a gun in school? Because but, the coach isn't going to go through all the training you just talked actually, about. Actually, the, the legislation we put forward puts them through the SRO training. And what happens if that coach is a retired the master S- sergeant no, 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 in the wait, Army? Wait a minute. The, the SROs, first of all, have all been through the police academy. They're not just somebody who went and My took a course. My point is, Franklin, they can be someone who's who's fresh out of the academy, fresh out of the SRO training, with no actual experience well, on the why, street. So why don't we just use the SRO? Your, argu- your argument, I'm John, okay is with more you want to put am. people in there with guns who have less training no, than police what, officers. No, my argument is not to put them in there. That's the, that's the fallacy of what you're you saying. You just don't my want to argument, pay for them. No, S- I don't mind paying for one SRO in that school that's carrying... If a nut comes in to do harm, the first person he's going to find is that SRO and blow his head off and then start from there. Now then, if he doesn't know where to go, he doesn't know where to start, and most likely he will not go to Well, here's the thing. Okay, this is what I want in schools. I want people with the most training that they can have. I want the most that we can provide there for them, the, the children, as in people. So two or three or four SROs works for me, and that's the force. Some, one person coming in is not going to take out all the SROs. Come on. But, I mean, to have this you idea know, that we're going to arm one person, you one cannot, teacher or administrator. Uh, you cannot afford to put four SROs in every school in this country. It'd be impossible. Why could we not? It's impossible. How is it impossible? Money. Go talk. What? No, wait a minute. Right now, how much are we over budget? How much? I mean, we can't. We, we don't have a money tree. It's well, not raining I would, money. I would hate for us to have to find more revenue in and, order to well, protect I mean, our schools. Oh, yeah, I would, too. Because I here's would the too. problem. The Republican Party doesn't want to not pay for that. What we want to do is we want to look at our spending and go, is there somewhere else that's not as important that we could cut yeah. to pay for that? You I think know, that's great. Thing, so we could find the revenue, next thing, I think. Next thing I, that that's an is, argument. Next thing that happens is the SRO money is taking up educational funds. That's well, going to well, be the well, next let me argument. tell you. There's no doubt that in the last two years, there was a big debate going on in our county commission where people were advocating taking the SROs we have out because it was too expensive for them. I don't think it was too expensive. I thought it was a valuable service at the time. And when we get valuable services, we ought to be willing to be responsible and pay for them. If teachers and administrators are willing to go through the stringent testing and qualifications and training in order to be an undercover officer, so to speak, I think they should have the opportunity to do that. Keep in mind, Andy, that the the amount of training that they're saying is going to go in, I promise you eight hours of tactical training with a law enforcement agency, you will be vastly superior over to the call of duty, scared, wet kid that's coming in to do mass destruction. I promise you will be the, the active guy in that room. That's All the right. scariest ever thought. We've got to go, and uh, I want to thank uh, Warren Duncan for coming in from Volunteer uh, Ordinance Works today, and appreciate you coming in today, Warren. Thank you. Andy uh, Brown, thank you for coming in today. Franklin, John, thank you, guys. Now then, one thing I've learned from today, I think uh, I will buy a cannon and put it in my front yard and boat it down, and that will be a sign that I'm a gun owner and that no one should come close to my house, right? I think that would be a great idea. I think that probably would be a good start. Maybe you ought to stock up on some cannons, and think everybody can just buy one and mount it in their front yard to show just like a uh, security alarm 
uh, a sticker. That would abide by the uh, potential uh, low capacity loss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, be sure. Uh, Warren, where is your store? It's at 2150 South Lee Highway. We've got an indoor range there as well. Off oh, of the carry class. Yes, That's sir. about a $2 million investment, isn't it? Uh, it wasn't that much, but it was very expensive. Yes, sir. An indoor firing range. I didn't know we had one here in Cleveland. Yeah, eight lane uh, heating and air. Daniel Brantley's been down there shooting. It's uh, uh, We're very proud of it. You should come check it out. And what's the address again? 2150 South Lee Highway. I believe it will. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you thanks. next week. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson, John Stanberry, and Franklin Chancy. Catch them again on Whoop FM at noon today and every Wednesday morning from 7.30 to 8.30. Now, back to more music on Whoop FM. Raising the debt ceiling does not authorize more spending. It simply allows the country to pay for spending that Congress has already committed to.